Ireland's ancient monuments are majestic, spiritual, sacred sites that connect us to our earliest ancestors. Well, at least that's what I was always told. Our small island is full of mysterious sites like this one. We think of them as the sacred places, and I suppose they are. But the story I'm about to discover is not exactly sacred. Oh, it's sacrilegious, if anything. In the 1930s, just a few generations ago, the secrets found in places like this were at the centre of an epic quest. Not a quest for gold or treasure, but to explain the very origins of the earliest people in Ireland. A quest, no less, to find out who we are and where we came from. It was a time when intrepid explorers were digging for treasure around the world. For the next big find, all eyes were on Ireland. But Partition was barely 10 years old. Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State were busy forging new identities. In both states, a feverish search began. One place to look was the ancient past. And it all kicked off here in the hallowed landscape of County Sligo. In 1931, an American professor from Harvard University, he inspected these monuments, wondering if Ireland would be the place for his next big dig. Needless to say, he was hooked. Well, why wouldn't he be? This moment triggered an archaeological frenzy. Both north and south of the border, excavation teams raced to unearth evidence of the first Irish men and women. Unearthing this story will take me to some unexpected places. This is literally the end of the world. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if we actually find some ancient Celts up here. I'll experience some strange science. Oh, she's only reading the instructions now. <laughs> Uncover dark history. And get a flavour of the footloose world of early Irish archaeology. I mean, nowadays, we'd be thinking serious health and safety headache. <laughs> My own quest is to uncover what they found and what it says about us and to figure out why this story has been forgotten for so long. The one thing I was always sure about growing up was my Irish identity. I was steeped in our myths and legends as a child and enthralled by our unique sports and music, our native tongue, and not least my Celtic heritage. So when I stumbled upon this story, I was fascinated, but also nervous. I mean, I hope I haven't been deluding myself all these years about who we actually are. My own delusions aside, there's one thing you need to understand about this story. In the 1930s, our mysterious megaliths were even more mystical than today. North and South, many of these monuments were simply called Celtic, because no one really knew who built them. But with the new border, these ancient sites became, well, political. In the South, the idea of a Celtic origin was central to Irish identity. But in Northern Ireland, some were questioning these Celtic roots. This is tricky history, so I'm hoping Professor Dermot Ferreter can explain how Northern Ireland was forging its own path. This is an illustration of their own path, very iconic image. Edward Carson outside the Storm and Parliament, they were an announcement that Northern Ireland had arrived. The statue of Carson is actually unveiled in 1933 when he's still alive, and he is the godfather of modern Ulster Unionism. And the unveiling of the statue, of course, was a reminder that this is where it started. Their ancestors' loyalty to William of Orange, King of England. And it is about loyalty to empire, loyalty to crown. Now, as in olden days, Orangemen turn out in full regalia. South of the border, there was a very different message from a newly elected leader, Eamon de Valera. Conquering hero arrives, Mr. Eamon de Valera. Who's just been announced Full disclosure, Eamon de Valera was a revered figure in my house. My father was a member of his party, Fianna Fáil. They even met, along with my mother, aunt and granny. 
As you can see, it was a big deal. I think those so I need a more objective view. The present government of the Irish Free State has been elected it really heralds the dawn of a new political age in Ireland. De Valera, his new Fianna Fáil party, have taken power in 1932. This programme aims at restoring the unity of this island and creating an independent Ireland, living its own cultural, economic and national life. What we're seeing here is also about De Valera setting out his stall. I am going to make Ireland self-sufficient. It's about political self-sufficiency, economic self-sufficiency, cultural self-sufficiency. We are embarking on a mission to make this a truly Irish Ireland. And, and in a sense, like, create an origin myth as well, uh, harking back to a, a glorious Celtic past. There's a deep, deep reverence for the past, for Irish antiquity, for stressing we are unique, what we have brought to the world. And there really are two state-building projects going on on the one small island, and, and they're drawing on uh, particular traditions to reinforce that state. Trace their ancestry to this little island with its long and tragic history. So one of the interesting questions was whether the, the newly created border, the physical border from 1920 and 1921, actually reflected much deeper, uh, more layered and deep-rooted differences. And that was where the research of the, of the 1930s was going to uh, throw up very interesting findings and conclusions. <laughs> The archaeological world was fascinated by Ireland, drawn to the promise of discovering the origins of an ancient Celtic race. In 1932, an American archaeologist from Harvard, no less, brought his team to the country intent on digging up Celtic sites. They called it the Harvard Mission to Ireland, and their command HQ was here in Dublin. Dr. Mairead Carew is one of the few people who knows this forgotten story inside out. It seems to me that the whole archaeology field at that time in Europe was a bit of a macho pursuit. I mean, it reminds me of Raiders of the Lost Ark or something. Yeah. You know, these guys scrambling all over Europe, trying to find something that would explain our origins. At the time, Ireland was perceived as having that pure Celtic heritage. There was loads of archaeological sites, so there was great potential. Right. Sounds like the perfect place to excavate. What were they trying to prove about our origins? They wanted to find out, really, uh, who the Celts were, where they had come from, and who their descendants were in the modern population. Ah, the Celts, my tribe, my ancient ancestors. They believed that a lot of the beautiful objects that they had were made by the Celts. But there was an ancient civilization, pre-Norman yeah. invasion, yeah. that we were descended from. And this suited the Irish Free State at the time to strike a, a, a distance between Ireland and Britain. They were looking for connections almost anywhere except Britain. They didn't want to be connected to Britain on, on any level. Don't worry, this isn't another story about England and Ireland. It's about Ireland and the world in the 1930s. And in the South, that story had a central character an Austrian archaeologist named Adolf Marr, who came to work here at the museum in 1927. He was an expert in Celtic archaeology. A few years later, then, he was promoted to the position of director of the National Museum. He also pretty much handpicked the sites for the Harvard mission. <laughs> Now, I've been looking into this Adolf Marr. As an archaeologist, he'd worked on some of the most important Celtic digs in Europe. In 1927, the same year Bewley's opened here on Grafton Street, the 40-year-old Marr saw an advert in an Austrian newspaper for the job here in Dublin. Now, the awkward thing about Adolf Marr is that he'd become a Nazi, card-carrying and bona fide. In fact, he was the most prominent Nazi in all of Ireland. But in 1927, he was just an archaeologist, with a single passion, an obsession, really, for all things Celtic. Adolf Marr's Celtic-facing history suited the Irish Free State just fine. But across the border in Northern Ireland, a different view of history was emerging. I grew up in County Monaghan, along the border. So that makes me an Ulsterman. Oh, yes. 
And even though you mightn't recognize the border as a geographical factor, politically, it definitely shapes you to some extent. When people hear you're from Monaghan, from Ulster, they assign you certain characteristics. They think of you as maybe doer, or deadpan, or reserved. Watchful is the word I prefer. So it's fairly clear where you grew up shapes your identity, whether you like it or not. So technically, I'm an Ulster man, and now I'm headed to Belfast. In the wake of partition, Northern Ireland began to bolster its cultural institutions. In 1929, the Ulster Museum opened, and the state also brought in some outside expertise. While Adolf Marr was quickly becoming the most important archaeologist in the Irish Free State, another blow-in was settling into a new life here in Belfast, and he was to become the most important archaeologist north of the border, an arrival to Herr Marr. So let's hear it for Welshman, Emir Eston Evans, famous professor at Queen's University, Belfast. All through Ireland, you have the remains of circular enclosures called raths or fairy forts. And round the corner from the Ulster Museum is his home. Alan. Alan. Luckily, his son Alan still lives here. I've come to have a good nose through the old family archive. For your interest. Oh, thank you. Photographs from digs in the 1930s. Ah, lovely. Fast forward, holiday snaps, rather fetching old fashioned swimming costumes. Yes. According to my mother, he was very good looking, and I'm sure she was right. Digging at Lyles Hill, which my father was excavating 1937 38, and this is Derry. Mm -hmm. And here we, we're here at Achnes Gate. So obviously they were camping. My mother as a young woman, my father as a young man. Uh, Geographical Association visit 1933. And here we have Goward. This is in May um, 1932. Was that the first time he dug in 1933? That's the first dig, yes. Yeah. That took them six days. So it was a bit of a smash and grab by the yeah, time. Yeah. But, uh, so, Alan, how did your, your father end up in Belfast? He'd finished his basic degree in Aberystwyth, which was in anthropology and geography, and um, a job came up. He was interviewed on his 23rd birthday to set up a geography department at Queen's and was given the, job, given the post. He became interested in archaeology and basically started archaeology or revived archaeology in the north of Ireland. It must have been quite an exciting time, I imagine, in, in, in Belfast, a relatively new state. I guess people like your father got a free run of things, really. Yeah, I, I think that is true. Um, it, it started off very much on, on an amateur basis. The first dig at Goward, his main helper was my mother, they'd been married a year, and some more dedicated amateurs. That was the start of it. Eston Evans wanted to trace Ulster's early settlers by studying the ancient megalithic court tombs dotted around the landscape. And he had this particular interest in these court graves or court tombs. Mm -hmm. uh, what, was his, what was his fascination there? It was uh, a, a really an intellectual um, challenge to decide what was their source. Mm -hmm. um, did they come across from the, uh, from the east, across Scotland, um, from Northern Europe. They were, seemed to have a predominantly Northern distribution. And they were interested in studying and finding out all they could about them. And they... It probably end, took an outsider to do that. Yeah, I think it, it did. I believe it took an outsider to really be interested in the megalithic structures. He seemed to discover that the northeast of Ireland had a special character that, that was there long, long before partition, a character all of its own. Yeah, I mean, he did like the north of this island. But it must have 
must have been incredibly exciting, like, mm. you know, stumbling upon a ruin that was neglected. Or well, wasn't even uh, considered to be a ruin. It was just a pile of stones in a field. I mean, nobody even knew it yeah. was there. And he comes across these sites and he starts digging with his friends and his wife and he finds evidence of prehistoric civilization. The thing that drove him was just an insatiable intellectual curiosity to try and understand the past. I think I need to see these piles of stone for myself. So I'm headed to County Down, to the little townland of Gower. This was the location of Evan's very first dig. It would put Northern Ireland firmly on the archaeological map. But for me, the Goward Court tomb, well, it's proving a bit difficult to find. So we take a left. Right here. Where do we go? Left. Sorry. Somewhere else. Wrong way. Sorry. What? This way. Somewhere around here in 1932, Eston Evans broke ground on his first big dig here in the foothills of the Moor Mountains. I honestly don't think anyone has been here since. This is literally the end of the world. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if we actually find some ancient Celts up here. Now, Esther Nevin's digs may look small and amateurish. Here at Goward, he had what he described as meagre funding from the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. Big spenders. But he made do and did valuable work with what he had. So Alan gave me this photograph. It's his father and mother standing, I think, exactly here. These stones once formed what's now called a court tomb. It's where Neolithic people interred their dead around 5,000 years ago. Like myself, Eston Evans was fascinated by them. This is a copy of the dig report. It's just a few pages describing the excavation. Evans, he called this tomb a horned cairn because the rocks are laid out like devil's horns. The report also lists what Evans found. Some pottery, several quartzite pebbles, a good deal of charcoal, an unworked burnt flint. Hmm. Pebbles and burnt flint. <laughs> Not exactly Tutankhamun's tomb. But interesting nonetheless. It may sound underwhelming, but Eston's dig here at Goward was the first scientific excavation on a court tomb ever. It was important because it actually tried to map out the site and compare it to others. But for Eston, it also marked the beginning of a grand theory that these Ulster megaliths were built by people with roots in Britain most likely Scotland. A few weeks after Eston Evans left Goward, the Harvard mission arrived in Ireland, led by the esteemed Hugh O'Neill Henkin, an American professor with both Irish and German roots. His first dig was in Ballanderry Bog in County Westmeath. The excavation was anything but meagre. This is the dig report for Ballanderry. It's long, 80 pages long. Don't worry, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. But at the start, there's a special credit. The expedition excavates in Ireland in cooperation with and under the auspices of the National Museum of Ireland, which has very kindly granted every facility and assistance, both in excavation and museum study through the kindness of the director, Dr. Adolf Marr. Dr. Marr is also called upon officially to inspect the excavations. Sounds like Dr. Marr is a bit of a control freak. The dig at Ballanderry was on what's called a Cranog. Man-made islands thought at the time to be Celtic. It was, for one thing, an ancient Irish custom. 
to live uh, on lake islands are Cranogs or lake dwellings. Cranogs were well known here, but I wonder what the Harvard mission made of them. The Americans had never come across a Cranog before, I presume. Hugh O'Neill Hankin, what he actually said was, um, I learned how to dig a Cranog by digging a Cranog. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first scientifically excavated Cranog, and it worked. They found 650 artefacts, from swords to pins to ornate hanging bowls. But the star find was a strange one, an ancient gaming board. What Henkin said and others said at the time was it, it was some sort of little uh, war game. A bit and like checkers Something or like that, because, because as far as Henkin was concerned, the Celts were into their games. This gaming board lit up the international press. One Chicago newspaper reported it as a carved backgammon board which was used a thousand years before St. Patrick came along. Then, noted dryly, a couple of smashed skulls were unearthed alongside. This would seem to point at some ancient debate over rules. This was just ten years after Tutankhamun's tomb had been opened in Egypt, kicking off a global craze for archaeology. Ballanderi put Ireland on that map. But it almost didn't happen, because the dig was actually rejected by the Ancient Monuments Council of Ireland. Adolf wrote to a friend about this dig. I'm not going to do the accent. As I knew the Americans would not abuse my confidence and were very capable diggers, I got so annoyed about the stupidity of my council that I simply broke the law, of which I am supposed to be the main watchdog. I gave them the best cranog to excavate of which I knew. Well, as they say, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Like Eston Evans, Adolf Marr was working on a grand theory. But instead of Scotland, he was convinced Ireland's ancestors stemmed from the Celtic tribes of Europe and that Cranogues represented Celtic architecture. But well, his contention was that there was some pan-European culture. Exactly. He, like, he believed that, yeah, there was sort of a pan-Celtic culture across Europe. And that Ireland was the last vestiges of this. Exactly. Yes and that you are most, more likely to get evidence for your pure Celtic race I here in Ireland. Mar loved the idea of a grand Celtic race and thought the world would love it too, especially Irish Americans, who were gaining more and more clout in the US. In 1932, the Yanks were busy preparing for the Chicago World's Fair, an event not lost on Adolf Marr. Usually the headlines were ancient Celtic glory, which Adolf Marr was behind, because he did the press release. It came to the Chicago World Fair. There was a, an exhibition called A Century of Progress in Irish Archaeology. And these three objects, they were put in the... As evidence of a great yeah, pre-Anglo-Roman civilization. Well, what they called it was evidence of the genius of the Celtic race. This Chicago World Fair was obviously a pretty important event, and it kind of put Ireland on the map a little bit. The whole idea was to show Americans who were related to the Celts by blood what the genius of the Celtic race was. It kind of worked. It gave Irish Americans particularly a lot of pride in their roots. Absolutely, yeah, it, it did. Another depiction of ancient Ireland also landed at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. Images taken by an Irish-American who'd come back to the old country. Robert Flaherty's documentary, Man of Arran, would kind of take the world by storm. I remember seeing this first as a, as a sneering student <laughs> in the 1980s, uh, but even then I found it quite stirring. Robert Flaherty came from Michigan, but had an Irish father. He was a, a very well-established and successful filmmaker. He had first visited the Arran Islands in 1931. He spent nearly two years on Enishmore, the largest of the Aran Islands. He's drawn to this idea of an ancient civilization on the fringes uh, of Europe. Uh, you couldn't find a more isolated and remote community. The timing of this was interesting. It satisfied that need for recognition of the Irish struggle, of the Irish traditional way of life, of the heroic self-reliance 
and self-determination that we would triumph, that we would succeed against the odds. But under the surface, not everything in Man of Aaron was as it appeared. What he is depicting is a way of life that has actually ceased. For example, the most famous scene in Man of Aaron, the shark hunt, yeah. the attempt to try and get the shark with the harpoon. Keep your head up, Pat. They had long stopped hunting in that way. Too high. Take it down. The actress who uh, performed that role, they had to be trained in how this used to be done. They're hunting the shark for oil, for lamps. But electricity had already come to Inishmore. So Flaherty is conveniently Just leaving out the modern world. idealising and romanticising this there is, primitive way of life. There is an idealisation of the uh, primitive way of life. The climax of Man of Arran is a big storm through which the Arran Islanders are rowing to get home, as you do. But amidst the tempest, a prominent Austrian lay just off camera. Adolf Marr with Gustav, his son, was watching it from a small steamship, which must have been difficult when you <laughs> realise the scale of the tempest. Flaherty would have consulted with Adolf Marr. Flaherty had to get a very strong sense of the history that lay behind what he was taking on. Did Irish people flock to see it themselves? When you look at the Irish Premier, Eamon de Valera is there as, as head of government. W.B. Yeats, Ireland's greatest living poet, Nobel laureate. This is a big deal. It's showcasing Irish self-sufficiency. Adolf Marr was also at the Dublin premiere. What he saw was the perfect portrayal of his notion of the ancient Irish Celt. Eston Evans, researching up in Belfast, was always more precise and factual in his conclusions. The purpose of this mound has never been explained, and its excavation offers exciting possibilities. I also learned the upstanding Queen's professor was not one for romanticising the past. In one of Eston Evans' books, I came across a telling line. I am no supporter of those who indulging in sentimental regrets for a Celtic twilight of doubtful authenticity find in the past a golden age to which they would have us return. Ooh. I think it's fair to say that Evans would not have been impressed by Marr's fixed notion of the ancient Irish Celt. Adolf Marr was the undisputed champion of archaeology in the Irish Free State. Eston Evans was the champion of archaeology in Northern Ireland. But their views on Irish prehistory couldn't be more different. So it may seem strange that in 1934, Marr asked Evans to excavate a court tomb for him in County Louth. But Marr knew Evans was the best man for the job and court tombs were his speciality. The location at Agnes Ski, as described by Evans, is classic rural Ireland. Cairnay lies on the land of the late Owen Matthews, now occupied by Mrs. Gray, but access to it was obtained through the property of Mrs. Keenan. Today, the two sites are tucked behind an old mushroom farm, which is where American-born archaeologist Matthew Stout is attempting to locate them for me. One, two, three, and maybe a fourth one over there. You had a cairn and you had access into the cairn through these galleries. These galleries would have been covered and open, so you could have accessed them generation after generation for the burials. That's why the emphasis was on tomb, court tomb, passage tomb. For Evans, excavating another court tomb gave him more data as he worked out his theories on where the megalith builders came from. But the dig at Akneski was different. Here, he had resources, men commandeered under a new unemployment scheme created by Eamon de Valera. One of the things that S. and Evans liked about this site was that it was circular. And there are circular type gallery graves in Scotland. For Evans, this was evidence that the Neolithic people who built this megalith were from Scotland. 
Behind me, you can see the mountain which marks the border with Northern Ireland. Over that mountain, in that direction, you have Carlingford Lock. He believed that this was the entry point for the Neolithic settlers that came from Scotland up into the northeast of Ireland. In contrast, he thought the Neolithic settlers in the south came up the River Boyne. His idea was that the boundary stretched back to prehistoric times. That was mirrored in the fact that you had one type of prehistoric culture in the north, which was uh, people who built court tombs, and the other type of, of prehistoric culture in the south were the people who built passage tombs. Eston Evans saw court tombs as distributed coast to coast across the whole northern half of the island. But in Matthew Stout's opinion, how others used his theories was beyond Evans' control. Now, Evans was a man of fierce integrity, and there's no question that he would have altered his opinions to suit the needs of the six county government, but it just so happened that the theories that he genuinely held suited the idea that the six counties of Ireland were always separate from the rest of Ireland. However, Evans was also concerned about the direction archaeology was taking in the Irish Free State. He was very conscious of the work that was being done in the Free State to focus all the attention on the Celtic period. He rejected the arguments of racial purity. He wasn't going to get involved in the whole idea of, of the Celts or the master races or anything like that. But that meant he never got involved in the theories that maybe Adolf Marr might have been uh, interested in pursuing when he brought the Harvard team over. Racial purity? Hmm. Just what was Adolf Marr and the Harvard mission getting up to on this island? It doesn't sound much like archaeology. Here in Trinity College Dublin's old anatomy building, I have a feeling I'm about to find out. <laughs> Hello, how are you, Hi. Gordon? Uh, nice so to see you. What is going on here? Well, these are some instruments, craniometers or calipers, and we have a small collection um, from 1891 when the Anthropometric Laboratory was set up. The Dublin Anthropometric Laboratory opened in the last decade of the 19th century to scientifically study the Irish race, whatever that means. Like, what is anthropometry? It is basically skull measuring and body measuring. Colour of your eye, your hair colour, cranial length, cranial breadth, cranial height, face length, face, face length. breadth, height, standing, weight. But to what end? <laughs> to what end? <laughs> is to find out the variations in people. By the 1930s, when the Harvard mission arrived, Anthropometry was no longer an emerging theory. It was seen as established science. And so fast forward a few decades, and then the Harvard mission came over, and they were ostensibly archaeologists. But what, what, what were they up to? They, they kind of introduced a bit of this anthropometry as well. Yeah, so there was three strands to the Harvard mission, and this was the physical anthropology strand. And at the top of that strand is Ernest Houghton, who's a Harvard anthropologist. Uh, he sets up a research team. There's two people in it, Helen Dawson and Clarence Wesley Dupertree. Uh, they come over in 1934 and 1936, and what they arrive to do is sample, as best they could, the entire population of Ireland. The Harvard mission's anthropometric survey took place in every county, in the Irish Free State and Northern Ireland. It meant quite a lot of travelling. Clarence Dupertree covers 45,000 miles by car, and uh, Helen Dawson, she travels the countryside by bike, and she surveys 1,800 females. Altogether surveyed almost 12,000 people. Not sure how I'd convince someone to take part in a skull measuring survey. His method is to find what he calls his rounders up uh, and whippers in. So he, he relies on a kind of informal network of Garda Síochána, of parish priests. They'll be expected to go round up local men. I think they probably turn up because it sounds like it's a bit of crack or it's a novelty. We're you know, paid. This, no, they're not paid. Um, not, even, not even a pint. No. Helen Dawson realizes that, that uh, a rumor has gone around 
that she's a Hollywood agent uh, scouting for new talent and all of a sudden loads of young Irish girls appear and are quite happy to have their head measured. Okay, Siobhan, I, I can't put it off any longer. I need to know who I am. You know, there's some instructions on the back of this sheet. Well, she's so. only reading the instructions now. The Harvard mission undertook their surveys in many towns and villages. They even took photographs of the local specimens, which looked strangely criminal. Not sure how I feel about all this. We have to do a little calculation. 155 multiplied by 100 and then divided by 200. We come up with a cephalic index of 77.5. So you, you are a, a middle classification, which is probably great just to think that you're normal. Yeah. So I'm average, right in the middle, maybe because I grew up on the border. But what about the conclusions of the Harvard mission? Did all this data say something about us as a so-called Celtic race? And did they find anything? They recorded everybody's measurements. So, so what we have is uh, you know, boxes and boxes of forms just like this, you know, 12,000 of them. What use are they to us? If we want to know what the physical measurements of people were in the 1930s, they're great. If we want to know what makes them distinctively racially Irish, they're not worth anything. Like, were the intentions uh, noble at the time? I mean, it sounds suspiciously like what we now know as eugenics. Eugenics is re really the idea behind it is that uh, there's a sort of a hierarchy of races. So, you know, at the top were Aryan populations, Nordic populations, white populations. Tied up with notions of nationalism and Absolutely, race. Absolutely, yeah. So it justified a sort of racialist thinking that sort of advocated that there were superior humans and inferior humans. I mean, it's, it's creepy stuff. It's very dubious, isn't it, and sinister. And ultimately, I suppose, Nazi genocide is the is the ultimate outcome. It's the end of the spectrum. Let me just remind you, the Harvard mission's visit <laughs> took place in the 1930s. Mare dell'aria. Benito Mussolini's brand of fascism had already been rooted in Italy for over a decade. And in 1934, the often angry and alarmingly popular Adolf Hitler, swept along by his now infamous rallies, was named Führer in Germany. Extreme nationalist governments were on the rise. So what was happening here? 1934 was a good year for Ireland. Well, at least for Adolf Marr. The Harvard mission was furiously digging up sites right across the island. Man of Aaron won the Mussolini Cup for best foreign film at the Venice Film Festival. And, oh, a Nazi party was founded in Ireland, with Adolf Marr as its first Ortsgruppenleiter, or branch leader. Ireland's Nazi party, like others around the world, was made up of Austrian and German expats, many of whom held powerful positions, like Adolf Marr. They'd meet together at the German Social Club or at a German-owned hotel in County Wicklow. Nothing to be alarmed about. Here's how the Irish press covered an Irish Nazi youth camp. Hitler Youth, County Dublin holiday camp ends. A party of Hitler Youth who had been in camp for a fortnight at Hampton Hall between Skerries and Balbriggan, County Dublin, dispersed yesterday when the German legation officials paid them a farewell visit. The party numbered about 25 boys and girls, most of them children of Germans living in Dublin, some from England and a few from Germany. A portrait of Hitler hung inside the house, while over the porch, crossed flags of Germany and the Hitler Youth were entwined with palms. As part of the programme, Adolf Marr himself, he had taken the youth on a cultural tour of Ireland, visiting historic sites such as Newgrange, where they looked at the passage tomb. Yeah, sounds like your typical week at summer camp. So, as far as the media was concerned, the Hitler Youth was all a bit of fun. While Marr was busy building his Irish Nazi party, the director of the Harvard mission, Hugh O'Neill Henkin, and his Indiana Jones-styled assistant, Hallam Movius, began a new search. An attempt to bring them face to face with the earliest inhabitants on the island. Men and women who they believed lived around 10,000 years ago in the Paleolithic era. Kilgreeny Cave in County Waterford, 
had been excavated in 1928, making headlines across the country because, well, they found Paleolithic human bones. Or at least they thought they did. The Harvard mission went back to make sure. So Hallam L. Movius, who is the Paleolithic archaeologist, went there in 1934 to see if he could recover more material. The rugged Hallam Movius and the Harvard mission arrived with an army of excavators from De Valera's unemployment scheme. Very quickly, he started suspecting the 1928 archaeologists weren't up to the task. Now, he wasn't very happy with the previous excavator, E.K. Trattman, because he was a dentist. <laughs> and he was one of these, you know... He was just looking for teeth. <laughs> he, no, like, he was with Bristol University, but he yeah. wasn't a trained archaeologist. More of a, a dabbler. Yeah, and you would have had a lot of people like that in the 20s and 30s, where they'd have an interest in archaeology, but they wouldn't have the training to back it up. And Movius was very unhappy, so he did a much more scientific excavation and found that the Paleolithic man turned out to be a Neolithic man. That is, the bones were around 5,000 years younger than thought. Once again, the results made headline news, but not in a good way. So they didn't find the earliest Irishman in the Kilgreeny. Hallam Movius and the Harvard mission now had to reframe their search. It meant that the oldest evidence for people on the island was in Northern Ireland. Objects formed by humans were found in their thousands. Flints, tiny flints. Just like the ones I passed in there without giving them a second glance. So the Harvard mission headed north to Cushion Dunn in County Antrim. Because while flints sound boring to me, for those studying the Stone Age, they're pure gold. Where you find flints, you find the people who use them as tools. So the handsome Halamovius began a series of digs where flints are practically lying around. There are quite a lot of uh, Middle Stone Age flint tools found in this bay and the surrounding area, and of course, all along the East Antrim coast. There might be just a chance I might pick one up as we walk along here, but so far I haven't seen anything. Cormac McSparren is an archaeologist from Queen's University, Belfast. He's excavated at Cushion Dunn before, so he knows what to look for. Up river from the beach is where Halamovius dug. A long grown over site Cormac is attempting to find using the dig report. It's uh it's reasonably clear. Uh, we've got the Dunn River on this side of us. Movius's site is located about uh, 100 feet or 30 metres, roughly, from the, the point down there. What Movius had stumbled upon by accident, really, was something which was really quite well stratified. The uppermost strata is going to be the most recent, and the lowermost one is going to be the most ancient. And Movius was able to dig into this bank and get the stratification going down. Several thousand years, actually, of stratification through silts and sands and another layer of silt and then finally a layer of post-glacial peat, five or six metres of open excavation. Huge amount of work, uh, done manually, of course. I mean, nowadays, we'd be thinking serious health and safety headache. <laughs> ah, health and safety gone mad. Looks to me like a bit of crack. But what Movius found in the strata at Cushion Dunn was like striking gold. Most of what he found was flint tools. Large, broad-bladed flint points. You can sort of see they've been trimmed here uh, to fit onto a shaft. Uh, they're very sharp even after, you know, six, seven thousand years spent on the ground before it was found. This is still really, really sharp. Still a very effective tool or weapon, or most likely probably for hunting, to be honest with you, and fishing. You could spear things of all sorts with this. Having discovered his cache of flints, Mobius began to work out where the people that used them came from. His money was on Scotland. He called it the Larnian culture. And this Larnian culture had similarities, he thought, to some uh, Mesolithic material in the west of Scotland. And he thought that there was, it was likely that they were related in some way. So the Larnian culture, named after the good town of Larne, were the first settlers in Ireland 
and they came from Scotland, according to Harvard's Halimovius. Down in Dublin, Adolf Marr didn't agree. Adolf Marr had a sort of competing theory. He believed that it was possible to link early Irish prehistory with wider European archaeology. His model stood in stark contrast to the model of Halimovius. Esther Evans' theories, though working in a different era, supported Halimovius. He very much also tended to tie Ireland generally into a sort of a more uh, Irish, Irish and British uh, milieu rather than a continental milieu. Hmm, Britain or Europe? Who to believe? Who to trust? What do you think, Cormac? The nation, the origin, is uh, a tenuous concept at best. It's extremely difficult uh, to tie down, but it doesn't mean that sometimes archaeologists have not got drawn into that. By 1935, time was running out for the Harvard mission. Their five-year plan was nearly over, but not before they'd excavated nearly 20 sites, from County Cork to County Antrim, and everywhere in between. So the Harvard mission had done its job, filling the museum in Dublin full of artefacts and impressing the archaeological world with new theories and incredible discoveries. But they'd never carried out a dig here in County Sligo where Hugh O'Neill Henkin first fallen for the mysteries of Irish archaeology. Now was his chance. Henkin chose a court tomb located on Sligo's western shore, a site named Creevy Keel. The tomb was similar to the one Eston Evans had dug in County Down, but while Goward looked like a set of 1930s teeth with a few missing, Creevy Keel was an American-style set of dentures. Intact, perfectly preserved, gleaming. Local expert Martin Byrne has come to give me the grand tour. It really survived unmolested and undug, I suppose, until the Harvard mission arrived in 1935. So that may be one of the reasons why they picked it was because it was in such good condition and it hadn't been dug by treasure hunters. In July 1935, Henkin and his men began digging at Creevy Keel. When they started, the tallest stone stood barely a metre above ground. Within days, gigantic boulders rose from the earth. As it emerged, Hugh O'Neill Henkin tried to make sense of the court tomb as best he could. There's an interesting story about the capstone leading into the chamber. Three local brothers were bored one day and they came and they pushed it over. And the locals all told Henkin that it used to stand upright, but he didn't believe it ever stood upright. So he put it back lying flat and it's actually the most dangerous thing on the site here because everybody who goes into that chamber cracks their head off it. Will we put it back the way it was? I was trying to get one. No. I don't think so, not today. I'm still unclear about who actually built these megaliths. Are we talking about the Celts? I mean, are these people Celts? When I studied archaeology, we were told there's no such thing as the Celts. And when you're a tour guide, you have to be very careful talking to people, particularly from America. Some people get very upset. No, these people were way, way before what we would have considered to be the Celts, even. The Court Cairn people are thought to have migrated through the Balkans and followed the line of the Danube and ended up, ended up in France. And you have lots of um, people going up the east coast of England, and you have people coming up the Irish Sea, and you have people coming up around the west coast of Ireland as well. So these are German, French court tombs. But what about Scotland? Evans was right. There were people who came over from Scotland and built those kind of monuments, and uh, people who came from France as well. The people who came from Scotland originally came from France anyway. So everyone's right. Eston Evans in Northern Ireland, Adolf Marr in Dublin, the Americans with the Harvard mission. I've visited these sites. I've read the reports. I've tried to get my head around exactly what these places are and how they relate to my identity as an Irishman and an Ulsterman. But I need more to go on. I need a geneticist. So essentially you study old bones. Yes, yeah. <laughs> to summarise, yes. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> Dr Lara Cassidy is an expert in ancient DNA. If anyone can help me, she can. Would you like some gloves if you want to hold a sample? Um, I suppose I should, really, yeah. shouldn't I? OK, so this is a Petrus bone. So can you see how this might fit on your skull? 
I'm hoping Lara can tell me who I am and how I relate to my ancient ancestors. We've been studying at the Harvard Mission to Ireland in the 1930s, and then there was a guy up in Northern Ireland called Eston Evans who was racing around different uh, historic monuments to try and find out, you know, who our ancestors were. Mm. So who do you think built them? Like, who built Creevy Keel, for example? Some very talented uh, Stone <laughs> people. Well, and a community, I think. Yeah. How did they relate to us living on the island today? Uh, <laughs> distantly. The idea that the Irish <laughs> population has existed in some type of crystalline state going back into the deep and distant past is... Really? Yeah. It's very disappointing, there. <laughs> so, our sacred sites weren't built by the Irish at all, at least genetically speaking. So what about me? Am I Irish? The modern day Irish population can trace its origins probably back to a foundational event that happened in the early Bronze Age. Yes, so give, me, give me a date. 4,000 to 4,500 years ago. And it's a movement in of populations from the steppe region of, of modern day Russia. If you're looking for uh, origin for the modern Irish gene pool, that's your foundation really? point. So I'm. Russian? Like, if you were to compare our DNA with the DNA of someone from the steppes now, yeah. would there be similarities? No, <laughs> because you can't think that the steppe region of Russia has stayed the same either. Because many had. of us were brought up with this, like, very strong idea that we were descended from the Celts. But you have to be so careful in studies of archaeology, anything about the human past and genetics. And researchers definitely have the tendency to bring their own subjectivities into it. Well, they did in the 1930s. And it's a dangerous game, this whole, like, you know, when, 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 where nationalism played a huge part. What are your findings about race generally? Race is not a genetic concept. It's not a biological concept. It is a social construct. Mm -hmm. People sometimes think that genes or genetics are, are, are more fixed anchor of identity than, say, a culture or a language. We know culture and language changes all the time, but so do genetic populations. They're ephemeral, they're fluid, they're changing, their boundaries are fuzzy, and people are always moving, they're migrating, meeting and mixing. As a species, we have an incredibly recent shared evolutionary history. We all trace our homeland back to Africa. Hmm. Russian, French, Scottish. Irish and African. And where do you think we come from? It's a different answer, whatever sort of uh, lens you put on it. Like, yes. where do I come from? Where did my parents come from? Yeah. My great grandparents, yeah. 500 years ago, 5 million years ago. I suppose you can think whatever you want to think. Oh, that's, that's the, the wonderful thing about human identity, yeah. isn't it? We can, we can make true. our own, and we can make our own as a society as well. Mm. But the thing that unites them isn't their genes, isn't their culture, isn't even their language. It's, it's calling this island home. If you're talking about looking for anchors of identity, that's, that's a really nice one. The 1930s, however, didn't have the data from Lara's work on ancient DNA, nor did it have our open-mindedness. In September 1939, War was declared on Nazi Germany, starting a conflict that would shake most people's faith in humanity. Adolf Hitler's actions, particularly the Holocaust, shattered any notions of a scientifically studied pure race. In Ireland, the idea of a pure Celtic race sort of slipped away. As did Adolf Marr. In July 1939, Marr travelled to Germany for an academic conference and to attend a Nazi rally in Nuremberg. He stayed in Germany. At one point, he made Nazi propaganda radio programmes targeting British and Irish audiences, a job that didn't exactly bolster his reputation. After the war, Adolf Marr tried to get back into Ireland to take up his old job. He wrote begging letters to everybody he knew, including this one to Eamon de Valera in 1947. It is now well over two years since the cessation of hostilities, half the duration of the shooting war, and I am still here. 
I have ever since frantically tried to enlist the support of the Dublin authorities in my endeavours to get back to my unfinished work, which I consider to be the vocation of my life. So far, I have met with no success. I can naturally understand that my past political sympathies and the general situation render my case somewhat delicate. But I beg Your Excellency to consider also the extenuating factors. I do not, and I cannot deny that I thought it my patriotic duty to join the party, and that I honestly believe that it stood for the common good of all Europe. This was an error of judgment, but it was not in contradiction to the loyalty and love which I felt equally for your country, which had given me hospitality and an honoured scientific position. But by this time, Adolf Marr had become a figure to forget. No one would touch him, not least Damon de Valera. Marr died in Germany in 1951. He was still hoping to get back to Ireland. Eston Evans spent the war in Northern Ireland, teaching at Queen's. He also wrote popular books about Ireland's heritage and eventually helped found the Ulster Folk Park. He even did the odd spot of presenting for the BBC. This structure is what archaeologists call a souterrain. One thing I wondered, though, did Eston Evans ever mention Adolf Marr? So I asked his son, Alan. It's well known that Marr was a Nazi. My father noticed Marr's interest in airfields and coastal regions. <laughs> and so they had a relationship of sorts. Yes, they? I, and they respected each other because Marr was a trained archaeologist. Mm -hmm. uh, he was about 20 years old than my father. But they were both very interested in developing uh, the techniques. But Alan also told me a story that suggests things could have been very different had Adolf Marr and Adolf Hitler gotten their way. And certainly my father was very surprised when he, a senior archaeologist in Dublin told him that Marr had commented that Estin would make an excellent Gauleiter for a mayor for the, for, for the north of Ireland when the great day came, but the great day didn't come, thankfully. Instead, Eston Evans had a long and illustrious career, becoming a household name in Northern Ireland, and he never went back to Wales. It makes for a strange sort of Irish story, without any Irish characters. Adolf Marr, Eston Evans, Hugh O'Neill Henkin, Hallam Movius. They dug up this island, excavated a warehouse of treasures, and went some way to decoding our mysterious megaliths. Yet it's a forgotten tale, because it happened in the 1930s, a dark chapter of history. But we should remember, they pioneered archaeology on this island as we know it today. But I have to admit, I'm slightly disappointed that there's no definitive evidence of an ancient and pure Celtic culture from which I might be descended. Of course, I'm not going to be swayed by mere science. No, like most people north and south, I prefer stories, stories rooted in the landscape of the mind. Because that's where these comforting origin myths arise, in the sometimes absurd and often baffling tales that we tell ourselves about who we are and where we came from.